It's okay to clap in the Lutheran church. It's good. Thank you, Larissa. Good morning and welcome one and all. I'm delighted to have you here with us today. Uh, worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am Gail Munt. I'm the intentional interim pastor, soon to be leaving, I think. We have uh, an announcement from your president, Don, please. I guess soon to be completing my work here. That's it. You know, that notion is kind of scary. We've been luxuriating in the loving arms of Pastor Gail Ah, but this long interim hopefully is moving to its next stage. And I just wanted to bring you all up to date on what's been going on regarding our call for a new settled pastor. So we are entertaining the uh, pastoral candidate, uh, entertaining bringing in the pastoral candidate of um, Pastor. And we have some opportunities to get to meet Pastor and know her better. The first is this Wednesday. Wednesday the 29th, and this will be a special event uh, from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock, and we'll have a chance to talk one-on-one uh, -on -one with Pastor Who will present herself at 6.15 and again at 7.15, so for if you can't be there at 6, don't worry. Uh, she'll present herself twice. You'll have ample opportunity to chat, to ask questions, to get answers. And that will help you inform a decision that you will be making next Sunday. What's special about next Sunday? Palm Sunday? Yes. We'll, yes. we'll also be voting uh, as a congregational member. Anyone who's a member in good standing will hopefully cast a vote. If you're here, you will vote, I hope, to accept or not pastor as our next settled pastor. So next Sunday, a big deal. How did we get here? thanks to our call committee. Our call committee worked long and hard and interviewed several candidates to, to determine, to discern whether this would be our next settled pastor. And they are all in. They voted unanimously to present pastor to the congregation. And I just want to thank them individually. It was a big deal uh, in, in reaching this point. And they are Kiyoki Huffman, Kathy Baki, Erica Berg, Leanne Bonetta, Jamie Cogswell, Roger Johnson, Bill Mathias, Chuck Rich, Ann Ritkowski, Jeff Simley, and Mars Zeitvogel. They represent a broad spectrum of LCM's congregation. They are all in. That's all I needed to know. I'm all in thanks to their work, and hopefully you are as well. If you have not yet seen uh, a brochure that was in the in the, in the bulletin last week, a brochure, a piece of paper that has a picture of Pastor and a little bit about her. Uh, there are 16 left back over here. So if, if you don't have one yet, be. Oh, we have a richness of paper. Wonderful. So if you're not one of the first 16, don't worry. You can still uh, see a picture of Pastor. Learn more about her before you get to meet her Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you, Don. And thank you to one and all who have brought the congregation to this point. I did want to make a comment on, uh, I've been asked, what does it mean to be a member in good standing? This is a constitutional uh, byline. And so it's, I'm going to just read it to you. Um, son, confirmed members during the current or preceding calendar year shall have communed in this congregation and shall have made a contribution of record to this congregation. So uh, if you're not a member yet, we're having members join next week. There's still time. And uh, we're having a get together with a council after worship today so that you, those who would like to consider coming to the class doesn't mean you're committed. I just want to say that. But if you'd like to meet the council and learn a little bit more uh, after fellowship, we'll go upstairs and talk about being a member. And then a contribution of record to this congregation. So if you've been throwing money into the offering plate and haven't received a receipt, uh, this week put it in an envelope, sign your name, and it'll, then it'll be uh, on good uh, record. That's, we've been really grace-oriented and loose with our voting at LCM, which is fine until you get to uh, this important 
vote where two-thirds of the congregation, two-thirds of those present have to vote positive in order for the call to happen. And so it is a very serious, it's a legal and binding contract call, if you will. So I just wanted to share that with you as well. We've got a lot of exciting things coming up. Um, meeting with Pastor Alwyn on Wednesday evening. On Saturday, April 1st, we have the Celebration of Life for Joe Kirchberg here in the sanctuary at 10 a.m., followed by um, luncheon in the back here in the space. And then, of course, Palm Sunday on um, Sunday and the congregational vote. On Monday, we have a wedding we're celebrating. Uh, Dave Mullen and Sari have invited us to their wedding. I get to preside. I'm excited. At 2 o'clock on Monday with fellowship afterwards. So you're all invited to that as well, too. And then we go into Holy Week. We have Monday, Thursday service at 7 o'clock on Thursday with, that's next Thursday, not this Thursday, with um, washing of the hands, uh, Holy Communion, and stripping of the altar. On Good Friday, we'll have reading of the lessons of the Passion Story along with music. It's a solemn service, powerful service. And then, of course, on Easter Sunday, we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. So I invite you to invite others. This is a great time to bring people into the congregation and celebrate with us, as well as hold us all in prayer um, in these coming days. So we thank you for that. As you're able, please stand. Welcome this day to the house of our God. Welcome this day to the worship of our Creator. Welcome this day to our community of faith. Friends, let us worship God. And we sing. seated. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who journeys with us these 40 days and sustains us with the gift of grace. Amen. Let us acknowledge before God and one another our need for repentance and God's mercy. Holy God, we confess to you our faults and failings. Too often we neglect and do not trust your holy word. We take for ourselves instead of giving to others. We spoil rather than steward your creation. We cause hurt, though you call us to heal. We choose fear over compassion. 
Forgive us, renew us, and lead us as we seek to follow in your way of life. Amen. Hear the good news. God so loved the world that God gave his only son so that all may receive life. This promise is for you. God embraces you with divine mercy, forgives you in Christ's name, and revives you in the Spirit's power. Amen. And we sing. my husband to preach today. So you're in for a treat, I think. Uh, Somebody said, how long has it been since you've uh, presided and preached together? And the last time we can remember was 2018, 2017. It's been a while. So, uh, but I'm very glad that he's here today. I'm going to read the gospel lesson because he said that it goes from chapter 11, 1 to forever. So... The Holy Gospel according to John, the 11th chapter, beginning at the first verse. Glory to you, O Lord. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill, so the sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. 
Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after hearing that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus answered, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into this world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here, and he is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were, were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench, because he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. 
Thank you for 45 verses <laughs> in the middle of John. Thank you all for taking care of my wife for the last year and a half and kept her out of most trouble. <laughs> all I can say is mostly trouble. Yeah, this is a fantastic passage. We were talking about it at home, and she says, I haven't preached on it for a while or in, in a good while. And I said, oh, I love this passage. And she says, you're on. <laughs> See, you just, can't, you just can't volunteer things. You guys already knew that probably about my wife. If you say too much, she'll volunteer you into to doing this. Back in 2008 in France, in a small town, they had a problem. Uh, because like a lot of medieval towns, they were, they were running out of land, running out of room. And it wasn't for retail space, or it wasn't for administrative space. It was because the seminary, cemetery was full. Dang, I hate when that happens, because people are just dying to get in there. You know that. <laughs> I had to say it. I had to. I'm sorry. I apologize. But they had a problem. What are they going to do? And so, you know, as a good politician, they tried other things, and it just didn't work. And so finally the mayor, being a politician, came out, and he banned anybody from dying. Because that's what you do as a politician, especially in France, because the French politics are always just uh, incredible. Anyway, if you don't have a deeper appreciation for them, you really should. But um, so we think that might be unusual, except it happens here in Colorado, in Vail. You can live in Vail. You can die in Vail. You just can't be buried in Vail. At least that's the way it was a few years ago, and I'm pretty sure it's the same now. You know, you have to go to Minturn or, or go to Leadville or something like that to be buried, you know. So if you're thinking about being buried in Vail, you know, scratch that off your bucket list. It probably is not going to happen. Yeah, we have this wonderful passage in, in, uh, in John that tells us so much about the images and, and, and so many things that are surround Jesus, his relationships with others and how he saw himself and how he saw the ministry that he was doing. It's kind of all encapsulated in this passage with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And these are friends of Jesus. When he went to Jerusalem, he would stay there. He would stay there. Where was there? Do you remember in the text, the first verse? In Bethany. Remember the names of some of the towns there? Bethlehem, Bethany, Bethphage. Bethany and Bethphage are close together. They're on the Mount of Olives. I'll explain that in just a minute. Bethlehem, a little bit south of there. Both of the, all three of those, Bet in, in, in Hebrew means house or village. So Bethlehem is what? House of Lehem is bread. Jesus was born in the town called House of Bread. Isn't that interesting? Going to feed the world, you know? Some symbolism here that sometimes is lost. Beth the G means the town or the village of the unripe fig. Well, that's exciting, isn't it? <laughs> I want to play for that team basketball for that organization there in that town, right? Where are you from, Beth the G? Unripe fig. <laughs> you know, that goes a long way. That won't, that won't even play in March Madness. I tell you what, it, it, it won't play. And Bethany means the house or the village of those who are ill. Remember the passage there, it says, when the anointing takes place of Jesus, and they said, what? And this took place in Bethany, and Jesus says, what? You will always have the poor. Remember that passage? Some people get disturbed by that passage. In the 1940s, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we found in the Temple Scroll, one of the most important scrolls that came out of there, it talked about Bethany as a place where people went for hospice care. Yes. And so this is the backdrop of Jesus doing his ministry. It could be that Mary and Martha and, and, and Lazarus had something to do with 
some of these places hospice care. And this is on the back side of the Mount of Olives, okay? So this looks out towards, if you've ever been, so Jerusalem's at 2,500 feet. Uh, the Mount of Olives is a little bit taller than that, just to the east of that, okay? And it's a rain shadow, so all the moisture that comes off the Mediterranean comes across, gives Jerusalem a little bit of drizzle here and there, and it, and it provides. And as soon as it gets to Bethany, it's a rain shadow. There is nothing that grows. It's called the Judean wilderness, and it goes from there all the way down to the Jordan River, and I mean down. At 2,500 feet elevation, Jerusalem and Jericho is about 1,100 feet below sea level. And you do that in less than 10 miles. You know, about 35, 3,600 feet of drop. So when the story of the Good Samaritan going down to Jericho or going up to Jerusalem, I have done that hike one time, and we, got to, we went down, and we got to Jericho, it was 115 degrees. Because Jericho is the hottest city in the world. Because it's what? It's the lowest city of the world being 1,100 feet below sea level. How many other cities are below sea level? And it's one of the oldest cities in history. So Bethany and, and, and Bethphage, these two towns up here on the Mount of Olives that Jesus frequented, this is where he stayed. And this was not unusual. When the Galileans, and he was Galilean, right, from Nazareth? Nazareth. Could anything good come out of Nazareth? You know, you got to say that with a little nasal tone, you know. So he was from, he was Galilean. So when they came down there for the Passover, they can't go into the city all at once. So different groups would come down and they would camp. And they would camp on the Mount of Olives. And then they would go into town. Because, you know, Jesus never really stayed all night in Jerusalem. When he came down to stay, where did he stay? In Bethany with Mary and Martha and that stinky brother. Just saying what the text already says, right? <laughs> you know, Martha points out the obvious. He's a little bit ripe in there. Unripe fig is in Bethany, uh, Bethany. <laughs> He's a little ripe in that tomb. Yeah, it's a very interesting. So you should be proud. You should be proud because we have a hospital on the Mount of Olives, very near Bethany, I mean, within a couple hundred yards of Bethany. It's called Augusta Victoria Hospital, and it treats the trauma and acute care of the Palestinian people, and it's sponsored by the Lutheran World Federation. Any of you been there? Seen it? If you go to Jerusalem, don't, don't pass that up. Go to the Mount of Olives and go over and see Augusta Victoria because that's where we're doing the same work that's been going on for thousands of years almost in that same very location of treating the poor. It seems that, and, and the ill, and it seems like that's where Jesus went oftentimes, right? Around the Sea of Galilee, there were a lot of hot springs, and a lot of people brought their ill people there to be treated. And so it's no wonder that we see, especially in John, we see a lot of signs of healing, right? John has seven signs. Before. So chapter 11 is right smack dab in the middle of John. Smack dab in the middle. Because we have 21 chapters. The first part of John talks about the signs. And five of the seven signs are what? Healing signs. Where Jesus heals different people of different ail of ailments. And a couple other ones. And he had that, that funny one at the wedding feast in Cain of Galilee. Remember that one in the second chapter of John? A very interesting exchange between his, his mother and, and the disciples and himself and, and the steward as well. Interesting story. And also the feeding of the multitudes. So those are your five signs. You've got, you got the healing signs, and you've got the uh, wedding feast in Cana, and you have the feeding of the multitudes. And then you come to the seventh sign. That's our gospel lesson. The, the, the bringing back Jesus, uh, uh, Lazarus from the dead. And so this is, this is the high point, if you will, of the gospel of John. He talks about light and life. Remember what he's talking about in this passage? It kind of seems like he's rambling on here, talks about, you know, light and, and stuff like that. But he's always talking about the light coming into the darkness, and the darkness cannot what? Extinguish it, right? He's talking about that early in John all the time, you know, light and life. And he's always talking about these signs and doing public miracles. This is the last one, basically. Because now Jesus is not going to focus on the crowds. 
He's not going to focus on doing those miracles necessarily, as signs at least. Now he's going to be focusing on what? The disciples. And he's going to tell them what? To love. Up until this point, love is only mentioned six times in the first 11 chapters in John. And after this, 60 times. 60 times. You can't miss that. That love is going to be central to what the disciples are going to do if these disciples are going to change the world because of the love of Jesus Christ. Shown in the resurrection of Lazarus, which kind of foreshadows Jesus' own resurrection, for sure. We understand that. So Lazarus, is this, this story is just immensely important. Two things I want to focus on quickly. The two words that he gives. Once he does all these things and he comes there and meets Martha and then Mary and, and does those things. And he calls into the tomb and he says what? Lazarus, come out. That's what Jesus is calling us to do today too. To come out of our tombs. Some of our tombs are self-imposed. Some of our tombs have been given to us because of unkind circumstances. Some of our tombs are, are, are those tombs that we just find ourselves in because it's part of our personalities. But Jesus is calling us out of that tomb, in, out of our tombs into new life. What does that mean to you today, to be called out of your tomb and given a chance at life once again? Because I don't know if you know this, but as you get older, you get set in your ways. I don't know if you've noticed that at all. But, but sometimes we need to get out of our comfort zone. I hope that when you come to church, occasionally you get called out of your comfort zone. Because we're not here just to be comforted. And yes, Jesus does comfort us. But there's also a challenge inherent within that too. Get out of your tombs. Lazarus, come on out. The price is right. And Lazarus comes out. Wow. Wow. Can't imagine what the feelings of those people were at that time. Can't imagine. Can't imagine. But then we go to the second passage, right? And he says what? He says, unbind him. And he says that to the people, the mourners that had come there to mourn. Because in Judaism, you know, you have about 30 days of mourning you know, usually when you, in Islam or in, in Judaism, when you die, you're quickly put into, uh, uh, you're quickly buried. We have a friend that has a rental place up on Colfax up here, and there's a Jewish cemetery right down off of the hill on Colfax. And uh, so he has a retainer on his backhoe. <laughs> so that they need to get a, a backhoe in there to bury somebody, because you really should be buried quickly in both of those. If you've been in the Middle East, you know that they bury people quickly. And then they have the grieving time. So this is why they had mourners there from the community that were supporting Mary and Martha in the death of their brother, Lazarus. And so they are there, and they are given the command to unbind, be unbind, because he comes out, and he's what? He's wrapped up in these burial cloths that the, that the women would do quickly. And then in, in, in Islam, we've seen this in Egypt a few times, they, they, the men go out and bury. The women prepare the body, but the men go out and do the burying. And so it's, it's interesting, these different cultures in the Middle East. And, of course, in the Middle East, you have to bury people quickly. Why? Because it's stinking hot. You know, and it can cause all kind of diseases and stuff. So it's by necessity as well as to honor. But that 30 days of mourning period is, is critical in Judaism. And so he says to them, unbind him. And I wonder if sometimes even in our lives, even though we know we have been saved by grace through the love of Jesus Christ, that sometimes I think we are still wrapped up in some of our old burial clothes. We may have stumbled out of the tomb but we're still not freed up enough to do what we need to do. And it's the community. It's why we come together here and worship. And any, any other time we come together, because in doing so, we are unbinding each other. That is our task at hand, to unbind one another. 
because we're all bound up by all kind of expectations, uh, traditions, um, nuances that are part of and parcel of life. But sometimes we need to be unbound from them as well. Yeah. So some part of this means that we have to kind of look at ourselves and say, where are our burial clothes? Where are the things that are holding us back, making us look like we're half alive and half dead at the same time? How can we be more alive in Christ? How can we be people of grace? How can we help others unbind themselves, not in a patronizing way, but walking hand in hand? You know, when we, go, when we traveled and lived in other lands, we did accompany that. We had to accompany other people in their faith journey, in their churches, in their organizations in these lands. We didn't go there to impose the American Western ideals onto these people. We came there to walk with them side by side. And that's what we need to do as Christians always, is never to be critical or condemning or argumentative, but to walk with people, to help to understand where they are coming from so that we can help unbind each other because that is our, cha- our, our task at hand. Sometimes things don't turn out the way you want to. There's a mountain right outside of Denver here, down 285, that has a big cross on it that's lit at nighttime. You know how big that cross is? 400 feet tall, 250 feet. You can't see it from here. You're too close, right? you got to go a little bit further because it was designed to be seen in City Park by the family that bought that property and turned it into a cemetery. Uh, you know the, Olinger, the, the, the whole, that whole story probably. If you haven't, Mount Lindros is the mountain, right? My, Lindo, right there, Lindo. And uh, so we had this lady that came into our congregation while I was over at Glory of God. And uh, she came because her kids were members of the church, and then she got old and she died. <laughs> and she, uh, she was a dear. She was really uh, a, a lovely lady. And she wanted me to intern her ashes up there. She didn't want to be buried necessarily up there. She just wanted to do it. So we went up there, and we were supposed to come down to Morrison and drink mar- uh, margaritas afterwards. This, seriously, this was her instruction, which we had to follow through totally, right? So we go up there, and I, I get these ashes out, you know, and, and, it's just, and it's just one of those beautiful Colorado days. We're looking out. If, you, if you're up there on top, you look out over the city. And I was, we were sitting there and just saying, wow, this is just glorious. And as I get ready to disperse the ashes, as I throw the, get ready to throw the ashes out, a gust of upslope wind comes. All the ashes go all over me and all over the family. And I am mortified. This was not what I had planned. They had not taught me this in seminary, and I did not know what to do. And I just looked at the the family, who are very dear friends of ours to this day, and I looked at Lynn and Jan, and I said, I am so sorry. And they looked at me and said, she would have loved it. (laughs) That was the perfect ending of her life, to have her ashes just go up helter-skelter everywhere. Now, we don't know how life is going to turn out. We don't even know sometimes how how the end of life is going to turn out. But we do know God's grace is there. God's love is there. And it is shown through the resurrection of Lazarus. And it's shown globally in the resurrection of Jesus Christ that death has no ultimate power over those who follow the Lord. And that's a challenge for us to believe sometimes when we are losing good friends and good family members right and left. But I hope we can hold on to that and we can be called out of those tombs, anything that's holding us back into the past so that we can live vibrantly into the future. And I pray that we can help one another get rid of those grave clothes to be untangled from them 
so that we might be people of grace to share to one another. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Uh, the picture up on the screen. Oh. You want to tell about it? Yeah. <laughs> Dang. Um, <laughs> I forgot it today. I was going to bring it so you could see it. This is an icon, and it's, you probably can't see it. I wish I'd have brought it. The but bigger screen. It's better, it's better it behind you. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. It's so, so you look at that. This is an interesting story. This, we were visiting, we were in Turkey and, and had a, a, a Christian conference in Anatolia. And so we dropped down into Cyprus, the island of Cyprus, which some of you know is divided between the north Turkish part and the southern Cypriot, uh, Greek Cypriot uh, area. And uh, so we were there, and, and Cyprus was one of the first areas that became Christian. And we know this because we know Barnabas went there, and we know that because Lazarus went there. After he was raised from the dead, the Jewish authorities were out to get him. This is church, church tradition. It's not biblical tradition. And that he had to leave. And that he went to Cyprus and lived for 30 more years and became the archbishop of Larnaca, which is one of the larger cities on the island. And so if you go to Larnaca, which we did, and by that icon, that icon right there shows Lazarus being raised from the dead. You can see they're unbinding him, and you see Mary and Martha. If you look a little closer, you can see the details of, of that. And then in the background, you have the church. In 980 AD, they found a tomb in the bottom of that church. It's still there to this day, and you can <coughs> see it. And it says, Lazarus, friend of Jesus. The final tomb that Lazarus, because he, you know, the one in Bethany, it didn't work. When he finally, di it didn't. It was a <laughs> terrible tomb. By the way, the tombs were used multiple times, all the time, because there would be families would have the tombs and extended families, so they would be used multiple times. So it's not a one and done thing. So here we have the tomb. In 980, where Lazarus died and, and was finally buried and stayed buried in Larnaca on the island of Cyprus. Reminding us again how people, when they were transformed by the encounter of Jesus, just like the rest of the disciples, did they stay home and put? No, they went out. They knew the calling. And the calling was to change the world through the love that they had experienced and the teachings that they had experienced from Jesus the Christ. So thank you for yeah. pff, my visual aid, and I forgot it all. <laughs> thank you, Randy. I invite you to stand as you're able. <laughs> seated. Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of creation. Okay. 
God, our sure strength, set the mind of your church on the spirit of love and kinship. Bring healing where there is division and hope where there is worry. Hear us, O Lord. Wait, we're going to sing. Sorry. Your spirit brings life to creation, enliven the natural world and restore ecosystems in need of healing. Uplift prophetic voices that turn us to the needs of the soil beneath our feet, the air all around, and the water that sustains life. Hear us, O oh Lord. and its peoples, free us from systems of oppression, unbind nations, societies, and individuals from the sin of racism, sexism, and homophobia. Raise up leaders at all levels of government who work to promote the dignity of every human life over the desire of power and force. Hear us, O Lord. You weep when we weep. Be present with those who grieve or who are troubled by illness, especially those on LCM's prayer list and those we name aloud or in our hearts. You hear us when we call to you. Deliver us from the depths of our despair and free us from the worries that bind us. We pray for this congregation especially those considering the membership with LCM. Nurture their faith and pour your love into their hearts. Help us to inspire each other in our community by sharing our testimonies to God's grace in our lives. Bless the one who will be LCM's next settled pastor and prepare us to be agents of change and grace. We pray for the victims of the tornadoes in Mississippi. Hear us, O Lord. are the resurrection and the life. Even though we die, we will live. With thanksgiving, we remember all of your saints who now live in your eternal love. Hear us, O Lord. Send us.
lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Uh, Offerings are welcome. There are plates in the back when you leave the worship space. If you'd like to put your envelope with your name on it or your money, and the that would be fine. There's also ways to give online, as is listed in the bulletin. Let us say our prayer for offering. God of good gifts, receive these and all our offerings as we present them in faithful service for the sake of your gospel. Prepare our hearts to receive you in this meal as you pour out your very presence through Christ Jesus, the wellspring of eternal life. Amen. God has received us, pardoned us, and loved us. Let us forgive each other in love and share the peace of Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you. I invite you to stand and share that peace with one another. There is hand sanitizer in the back if you'd like to use that before receiving communion. And just a few instructions. Uh, The host will bring you forward. We'll tell you when it's time to come forward. At first, we'll start with these two sides. They'll come forward, and then we switch and come over here for these two sides to come forward. Uh, We do have regular wafers and gluten-free wafers should you need that. There's wine and grape juice. Wine will be served by the first person and grape juice by the second person. If you'd like to receive a blessing, please come forward, cross your arms. I'm glad to pray with you. Or just let me know, and I'll pray with you um, as well. You don't have to do either or. It's a both and kind of world, right? That's what we Lutherans are. The most important thing for you to know is that this is not my table. This is not the table of the church. This is the Lord's table, and all are welcome All are invited, all are encouraged to come. God is with you. Let's try that again. God is with you. Open wide your hearts. May God's love nurture our wandering spirits each day. This is a season of wilderness, the season we grasp to understand the divine just a little more. This is the time for us to reach inwards, to find the self that God sees. This is the chance for us to gaze outwards, caring for the Christ in our midst. The Lenten roads are long, yet full of gifts. The Lenten paths often seem chilly, yet warm with the winds of the Spirit. The Spirit of God is the light that leads us in the hush nights. The Christ is our companion on the journey in the intense sunlight of day. We remember his time in the wilderness, 
the struggles, the hunger, the peace. And as we seek the divine in our midst, on this journey, we crave the bread of life. On our desert roads, we thirst for the fruit of the vine, the cup of blessings. Through Jesus the Christ story, we remember the night before his arrest, the night of serenity, solemnity, and love. Jesus took in his hands bread from the table. He broke it and blessed it. Eat in remembrance of me, he said. And after supper, as the night grew long, Jesus took a cup and filled it with the fruit of the vine. As he blessed it, he spoke aloud to them, Take and drink and always remember me. May the Spirit who traveled with Christ in the wilderness and fills us with the hope of God surround these elements. May the Spirit speak to us in this season of wilderness, becoming our strength on this journey and filling our lives with love. Amen. We lift our prayer to you using the words recited by all generations, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We remind one another Jesus welcomes everyone at this table. No one is turned away. If you seek God's presence, if you are hungry for this spiritual food, if you have questions and doubts, if you feel unworthy, this table is spread for all of us that we each might experience God's abundant and unconditional love. The gifts of God for the people of God. Amen. May this body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace from today to life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Divine light of our journey, in a spirit of gratitude, we give thanks for this time at your holy meal. This time at the table filled us with strength, knowing that as we continue on this Lenten journey, we will find your peace surrounding us. Amen. And again, thank you to Pastor Randy for preaching today, for giving me the week off, kind of. And uh, we are glad that you're here. Thank you for that. And I invite you to stay afterwards for refreshments there in the back of the worship space. And for those of you who would like to uh, meet with a council and consider joining the church, hearing the stories, hearing their faith stories, please join us. We'll go upstairs, oh, in about 15 minutes. We'll go upstairs and go to the back classroom. Uh, it's called the Jerusalem Room, I believe, but that may not mean anything to new people. So there's an elevator, there's stairs, and then we'll go back that way to the very back. I invite you to stand and sing.
God, the giver of life. No, I read that wrong. Let me, <laughs> I need my, sorry. No, mine does say life. That says love. Okay. Sorry. God, the giver of life and love. Christ, the resurrection and the life. And the Holy Spirit of rebirth bless you in this Lenten journey. Amen. Go in peace. Be the light of Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen.